am an engineer from MIT, and I began my life after I graduated in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, working in the energy industry, which was at the time the biggest industry in the world. When I got graduated over 50, uh, 40 years ago, the biggest companies in the planet were energy companies. Uh, you know, Shell, Exxon, BP, et cetera, et cetera, all energy companies. Today, the biggest companies are technology companies. You look at Apple, you look at uh, Facebook, you look at uh, Google, IBM, or the Chinese, Baidu, Tencent. It is all technology companies. But the transformation is moving so fast that in the next 20 years, the biggest companies will be longevity companies. Longevity will be the biggest industry in the world in the next 20 years. Uh, and it is moving very fast. After graduating from MIT, I began working in the energy industry. And now I lead the Millennium Project, which began as the futuristic part of the United Nations, looking at long-term trends. We look at what is going to happen in the world in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years. Uh, we developed the Global Challenges for Humanity, and we published a book recently, which is about the year 2050, where we have three uh, scenarios about the future, three possibilities by the year 2050. In one of those uh, scenarios, people will already be immortal. And I'm really happy to tell you we presented this at the United Nations so that people are beginning to understand that this is possible, and I believe this is happening very soon, in the next 20 to 30 years. Also, um, I'm one of the founding faculty of Singularity University uh, in 2009 with uh, my dear friend, mentor, and professor, Raymond Kurzweil. Raymond Kurzweil is the one who has been talking about the issues about technology and about the future. In fact, he has popularized the idea of the singularity, that by the year 2045, we will reach this technological singularity singularity, and also we will become immortal. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is not only an engineer from MIT, he is director of engineering at Google, he is the founder of Singularity University, and he's a leading expert on all the technologies of the future. Um, he basically put that all about 20 years ago in his global bestseller, The Singularity is Near, that was number one bestselling book in the New York Times. And now, next year, he's publishing the continuation that we auctioned yesterday here, the manuscript, the original manuscript uh, that will be published next year as The Singularity is Nearer, where he ratifies all his projections and deepens more into what will happen. Why will this happen? Because technology now is changing exponentially. Things are happening, moving faster. Things are becoming smaller, cheaper, and better. Most people don't think that this applies also to human life, but it is happening in life expectancy. At the time of the Roman Empire, in the year one, Anno Domini, first year of our time, basically human life expectancy was 25 years. Of course, some people lived more, but most people died young. So average life expectancy was about 25 years, and in some places, not even 20 years. And it was mostly um, sleeping and working. That is what we did. We slept and we worked. Then it has been increasing exponentially, and right now um, we are over 80 years in most of Europe, and this is still increasing. But if you look, there is more... Uh, education now at the top, and this is what's changing humanity. We are more educated, we are learning more, we are discovering more, we are innovating more, and life expectancy also is increasing exponentially. People don't understand the difference between linear and exponential change. If I give 30 steps linearly, 30 steps, each step of one meter, after 30 steps I have walked, 30 meters. But if I work exponentially and I double, 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 after 30 doublings, I have walked more than a billion meters and I have gone around planet Earth 26 times. This is almost impossible for us to understand because we think linearly. But technology is changing exponentially and all technologies. Most people who are my age or older, have used these. These are the IBM punch cards. That was, that was 1K of memory. It had 100 times 10, times 10. 100 times 10 is 1,000, 1K, 1K of memory. And we use that. I use that at university. I use that at MIT, at Massachusetts. We use that 1K of memory. 
Then the first electromagnetic memories were invented, which are more, much better because you could change it. In this floppy disk, the first one's eight inches big. It was also 1K of memory, only 1K. But you could change it. It was much better because the mechanical memories before, you could not change them. It was 1K, fixed 1K. But this electromagnetic memory was one uh, erasable and recordable memory. But I like to say 1K, one mechanical K plus one electromagnetic uh, K is, in Spanish, 1K plus 1K makes 1KK. One 1KK one of technology we had um, uh, 40 years ago. This is moving very fast, and we moved from 1KK to 512 KK to 1.4 mega, and now I have a pen drive of one terabyte. We have gone in 40 years from one caca to one terabyte. And this is not a stopping. This is only moving faster and faster. So this is what I have seen since I went to university, from caca to, to terabytes. And this will continue happening uh, very, very fast. And um, actually, I have my, my pen drive of one caca. No, no, this is one terabyte. But this one terabyte in 20 years will be caca. Caca. One terabyte in 20 years will be caca. We will have devices more powerful than the human brain in 20 years because this keeps moving exponentially. And we need to see the reality of exponential technology. And it's happening in all areas, not only with computers, also with medicine, with biology. The Human Genome Project began in the year 1990 and it finished in the year 2003. It took 13 years to sequence the human genome, the first human genome, and it cost over $1 billion just to the US government. Today, in the year 2023, you can sequence the whole human genome for $200. But it's going to be only $10 and one minute in a few years. Imagine, this is faster than what is happening with computers, much faster than Moore's law. A human genome, we are reading and we will be able to modify. So this is happening and that will change medicine. I will show you the partial sequence of my genome. Um, there are many companies that sequence the genome completely or partially. I will show you the partial sequence of my genome so that you don't know everything about me. But if you sequence your genome, you will know the probability that you have cancer, that you have uh, Alzheimer's and different diseases. Isn't this fascinating to know what you might die of in the future? So that you don't die of it, of it. Because if you can know what the diseases you might have, you will prevent them. Also, you will learn where you come from. This is my paternal line a few centuries ago, and you can see where I come from. In fact, I descend from Genghis Khan. If you look, Genghis Khan, on my father's side, on my mother's side, I descend from Maria Antoinette. So I have a very good pedigree between Genghis Khan and Maria Antoinette. We will be able to trace back our history, and we also will change people in the future. This is an experiment I did with one of my students at Singularity University. We shared genes. We shared genes. This is a theoretical experiment to see what could happen to our children and select those characteristics that, that you want. This will be a standard in the future. Actually, we are part of the last human generation that has not been designed. All of us are here by mistake. In the future, we will design the people that we want, the way we want them. And we are basically only data. All of us are only three gigabytes of data. This pen drive is one terabyte. How many humans can I fit here? How much is one terabyte by three gigabytes per person? 333 humans and a little cat. So you, you, we are not that complex. We are not that complex. Also, in fact, now there is a new discipline called synthetic biology. First, we learned how to read genes. Now we are learning how to write genes, to write genes. In the year 2000, we wrote the first genome of a virus. In the year 2010, the first genome of a bacteria. And by the year 2045, we will be able to write human genomes and better than human genomes. 
as a futurist, we normally talk about four ways to think about the future. The worst way, which is to be passive like an ostrich. Horrible, horrible. Don't be ostriches. A little bit less bad is to be reactive like a firefighter. Um, you respond when there is an emergency. But it is much better to be preactive when you buy insurance to be ready. And the best is to be proactive. When you build the future that you want, we can create the future that we want. So I hope we don't have ostriches here. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches that use the technology to raise their heads and see what will happen. At Singularity University, we used to say, Uber yourself before you get Kodak. We need to transform ourselves before all these technologies change everything. Um, 15 years ago, I went to visit Sir Arthur C. Clarke, one of the best um, science fiction authors. He wrote Space Odyssey 2001, for example. And he wrote the three laws of the future. First law of the future, when a famous scientist said that something is possible, he is probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he is probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the impossible is to pass beyond those limits into the impossible. And the third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we are going to see magic in the next few years. Technologies from the past, like personal computers, cell phones, Google, Facebook, are moving exponentially. And what new things we will see? We are going to reach human immortality very soon, which has been the first and biggest dream of humanity since we know. The first book in human history written almost 5,000 years ago, is the Epic of Hilgamesh in Mesopotamia. And it was about immortality, the first written book that we know of. But not only in Mesopotamia, also in Egypt, the pharaohs wanted to be immortal. The Chinese Emperor Qin Shi Huang, who built the terracotta army, he wanted to be immortal. The Spanish, they were looking for the fountain of eternal youth, Ponce de Leon. All civilizations have looked throughout uh, history for immortality, even religions. In the Bible, it says that the last enemy that shall be conquered is death. But we could not do it in the past because we did not have the technology. Now we do have the technology to cure aging. And this is interesting in these COVID times because if you look at who died with COVID, basically it was older people. Why? Because your immune system is much weaker. We get weaker, weaker, the older we get. And COVID actually was a very small pandemic. It was a pitiful pandemic in historic terms. It was really a very small pandemic. Uh, if you look at um, the Black Death, killed one out of three Europeans. One out of three Europeans. How many people do you think COVID has killed? Maybe 10 million people or even more? But it doesn't matter, it's nothing. It's a very small percentage compared to the Black Death. Or a smallpox, or even the Spanish, the Spanish flu. That was not a Spanish, by the way. It was American, <laughs> and it was not the flu. But the Spanish flu that we call killed about 50 million people. That would be equivalent today to uh, not 50 million people. It could be 250 million people today. 250 million people versus how many in COVID? 10 million, even let's make it worse, 20 million. But COVID has paralyzed the planet. How can a small pandemic like COVID paralyze the planet when we have big, big pandemics like a smallpox, uh, Spanish flu before, AIDS, or the Black Death, they did not paralyze the planet? Well, now we have even something worse, which is aging. Aging today we know is a disease, but a curable disease, and we should stop the planet until we cure it. Why? Because the number one risk factor is aging for anything, for Alzheimer's, for cancer, for Parkinson's, for heart attacks. It is aging. Aging is the enemy. It is not cancer. It is not Alzheimer's. It is aging. That is the problem. And until now, we used to think that diseases were separate, that they were not related. But today, 
new people are beginning to think that aging is at the center. Aging is the problem. Aging is what we have to solve. If we solve aging, we solve cancer, we solve Alzheimer's, we solve Parkinson's, we solve heart attacks. So the problem is aging. And so five years ago, my fantastic co-author, uh, David Wood, who studied at Cambridge, Cambridge, England, I studied at Cambridge, Massachusetts, we decided to write a book about the single most important issue for humanity, which is aging and death. 90% of people in advanced economies in the OECD countries die of age-related diseases. 90% of Americans, 90% of Europeans, 90% of Japanese die of age-related diseases. If you add terrorism, AIDS, malaria, suicides, accidents, climate change, terrorism, and all of that together, it is only 10%. So what is the problem? The problem is not it's not terrorism, it is not climate change, it is not uh, AIDS, it's aging. All of us are dying of aging, and we know that. All of us are dying. And this is the single biggest issue for humanity, and what can unite humanity for the first time? To cure aging. So we wrote our book, The Death of Death. I'm so proud that it was number one bestseller here in Spain and all over Latin America. Not once, but twice, in paper format and in uh, Kindle format. And now we are donating all the money to two foundations, one in the USA, the Science Research Foundation, and in Spain, um, a scientific foundation for children. And now the book is in many languages. Right now it is in 12 languages, a bestseller in many languages. Um, it came out just recently in English, Korean, Bulgarian, Japanese, now Chinese. So basically, it, this is very important in China because China is aging very fast. And China is aging before it got rich. At least Europe got rich before it began aging. But not China. China is aging very fast and they are not wealthy compared to Europe or North America. And China actually... This is Big China. I don't know if you know, this is the year of Big China. Big because now, this is the last year that, that the population is growing. From now on, the population will decline by half. Half of Chinese will die by the end of the century unless we stop aging. And also, India overtook China this year, 2023. China will actually go from over 1.4 billion to only 732 million. This has never happened in human history, never, in peaceful times, never. This is a crisis in China, and in Japan, and in Germany, and in Spain. The population of Spain will be half of what it is today, because there are no children. In Italy, there are no children. So my book is doing very well. But why is this also important? Because this is actually not only the biggest industry in the world, it is the biggest economic opportunity in history. Scientists have studied that if we extend the healthy lifespan one year, healthy lifespan of people, it will have an incredible impact of $367 trillion in the world. Just one year of added healthy life. These numbers are incredible. This is a study made by Harvard, London School of Economics, and Oxford. Top scientists from three of the top universities in the world computing what we call now the longevity dividend. Longevity dividend. Being young, being healthy is incredibly positive for the economy. Why also? Because this is a Pareto effect. Right now we expend 80% of the medical money goes in the last two years of life of a person. And the person still dies. Isn't that horrible? The person still dies after 80% of the money. So now what we have to do is to put the money at the beginning so that people don't age. Because if you don't age, you don't have all these medical expenditures at the end. Well, this is so that you don't die. But if you happen to die, call me and I'll freeze you. This is what we call Plan B cryonics. Actually, I froze the first Spanish person in the Iberian Peninsula. Right now, we have four Spanish people frozen, and there are hundreds of people throughout the world. But this is only if you die in the next 20 years. In 25 years, death will be optional or accidental, but there will be no mandatory death like today. So my hope is that you don't die. Death is never good, especially now that we are so close to immortality. 
as you will see. Uh, this is my friend that, that I froze a few years ago. Uh, uh, ago. Freezing is also important for space travel. I, I was part of the first generation of Spanish astronauts to go to Mars. We did a simulation in the year 2019. Uh, 2019 um, just before the pandemic to go to Mars. There, um, there you can see me. There is a a Mars simulation base in the north of Spain, where they are training astronauts. So I plan to go to Mars. That is also why I want to live long, because I want to go to the moon. Can you imagine a honeymoon in the moon? It's flying around, isn't that funny? Okay, anyway, so let's go back to the singularity, because the singularity is what will change everything, everything. And this is in the book now, coming soon. Um, all technologies are converging into the singularity. Nanotechnology that studies atoms, biotechnology that studies cells, infotechnology that studies bits and bytes, and cognotechnology technology that studies neurons. The two technologies on the top is what we call the software of life. No, the hardware. Nano and bio, the hardware. And the two technologies on the bottom, uh, info and cogno, it is the software of life. And these are all converging. And there are two important dates, 2029 and 2045. According to my friend Ray Kurzweil, uh, that I mentioned here, by 2029, we will reach, we will pass the Alan Turing test. The Alan Turing test. That means that you will not know in six years if you are talking to a human or to a machine. Actually, now it is already complicated. And do you know if I am a human? Well, in 2029, you will not know it. You will not know if I am a human or not. Also, we will reach what is called longevity escape velocity. By 2029, if we make it to 2030, we will basically live long enough to live forever because life expectancy keeps on increasing, but it's still aging, but it keeps on increasing. Thanks to medical advances, we will be living longer and longer until 2045, when we will have rejuvenation technologies, which is the goal, to rejuvenate people, because now we have discovered how rejuvenation is possible. And then we will also upload our minds. This is another possibility, um, Neuralink and other companies. Um, going back to aging, most people are beginning to understand that aging is a disease. Fortunately, it is a curable disease, and we will be able to cure not just cancer, Alzheimer's, we will cure the mother of all diseases, which is aging. In the last 20 years, scientists have been able to multiply by two the life expectancy of mice. We have mice that live the equivalent of 200 human years. We have mosquitoes that live the equivalent of 400 human years. And we have worms that live the equivalent of a thousand human years. These are called the Methuselah worms because they live almost a thousand years. And do you think scientists make these Methuselah worms because they like worms? No, because this is to be applied in humans. These are experiments to be later applied in humans. In fact, now we know that there are immortal cells. We don't have to invent them. They already exist. This was discovered, discovered in 1951. There was a patient called Henrietta Lacks who died in 1951 at the age of 31 of a cancer. The scientist took the tumor and chopped it in li little pieces and began studying the tumor. And they saw that the tumor grew, continuously grew. If there was obviously some water and food, to put it that way, on a Petri dish, and the tumor grew and grew and grew. Well, that tumor is alive today. And that tumor, year 2023, she was born in 1920. That tumor is 103 years old, and it is alive. And it is reproducing like a teenager. Even though it is 100 years old, it is having sex, reproducing, growing like a 15-year-old person. So we know that immortality already exists in nature. And tumor disco uh, cancer discovered it. And cancer didn't go to MIT or to Harvard or to Cambridge. So if cancer discovered immortality, 
we are going to discover immortality because there is nothing magic about immortality. Cancers do it all the time in different people, in different organs. So it is not that difficult to become immortal. But not only cancer cells are immortal, also germ cells, which are the most important cells in the body because they are the ones for reproduction. Cancer cells do not age. And germ cells also do not age. Our germ cells in our bodies that make sperm and eggs at the beginning in women, they do not age. They are called biologically immortal. In biology, that is how they are called, biologically immortal. They do not age. And they could live indefinitely if our somatic cells, our body, didn't die. So anyway, immortality is there. We don't have to discover. It already exists. Also, there are small animals like hydras, jellyfish, medusas, that are immortal. They don't age. That doesn't mean they, they don't die, because if another animal eats them, or if a rock falls on them, they die. But they do not age. They do not age. Immortality already exists. It was discovered by nature. And bacteria, the first life forms in the planet, are also called biologically mortal. They do not age. So the first life forms, not a recent life form, the first life appeared to live. The purpose of life is more life, better life, longer life, healthier life. My dear friend Aubrey de Grey was the pioneer of these ideas over two decades ago. He wrote a book called Ending Aging, where he explained all of this uh, 20 years ago. And he was called a charlatan. By my university, MIT, in the year 2005, said that he was crazy. He was a charlatan. 14 years later, in 2018, MIT actually said, oh, sorry, we were wrong. Immortality is really possible. A change of mind, of paradigm in 14 years at MIT. Well, change of paradigms. Arthur Schopenhauer said that all truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculized. Second, it is attacked violently. And third, it is accepted as self-evident. I want all of you to come back in 2045, to come back here. And remember today, when we accepted death as normal. And remember how primitive we were today that we let people die. Because by the year 2045, we will say, immortality was very close. So how could we let people die? This is so barbaric that we let people die today because it will be remembered how primitive we were today. Also take pictures. I want all of you to take pictures so that you look at those pictures in 2045 and you remember how old we were today. How old we were today because in the future we are going to be younger. Um, Ray Kurzweil, my friend, explains this in his book, Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. If we reach longevity escape velocity by 2029, 2030, we will make it into the second bridge and the third bridge of immortality. There is a lot of theory on that, no time for that, but read uh, my book, The Death of Death, where I explain it, or his book. Most companies today, technology companies, are understanding that this is real, this is serious, this is scientific, and this is happening soon. That is why companies from technology are moving into longevity. Mark Zuckerberg, he has said that all diseases will be cured, and he's donated all his money to cure all diseases, including aging. And he said something beautiful that I have never seen a father said until now, that his daughter will not die. How many parents can say that? His daughter will not die of aging. She could die of other reasons, broken heart, for example, but not of aging because we will cure aging very soon. If you don't like Mark Zuckerberg, maybe uh, Microsoft. Microsoft said that now we have sequenced the human genome and we discovered the mutations. We are very close to cure cancer. Remember me, in five years, we will cure most cancers. We are very close to curing cancer. This will be the biggest industry. Tim Cook from Apple said, Apple will be remembered but what they will do in health. Forget about iPhones, Apple products today. They will be remembered by what they will do in health. And then Jeff Bezos, 
Jeff Bezos has, has put $3 billion with other friends to cure aging. This will be the biggest industry in the world in the next 20 years. I don't know what you do, and I don't care. If you are not into longevity, you have no future. So moving to longevity, the biggest industry in the planet, 8.3 trillion per year in the future. This is growing from millions to billions to trillions of dollars. Most governments are investing in this. Saudi Arabia created a foundation called Evolution, Health Plus Evolution, to cure aging. They are putting $20 billion. And I just went uh, a few months ago to Dubai to the Museum of the Future, where we had a conference about immortality. I'm so happy to go in an Arab country and to talk about immortality. We had a session, Welcome to Everlasting Life, with uh, the father of Senolytics. One of the products I gave away is for Senolytics, and uh, Alex Shavoronkov, who, who has a fantastic half a billion dollar company in China. Uh, we talked about immortality. People now can talk scientifically with medical doctors, with scientists, about immortality. This is a reality. This is not impossible. In November last year, we brought here to Madrid the Japanese scientists who discovered that aging is reversible, that aging is flexible. Shinya Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize in 2012 for discovering four genes that control aging. And you can modify these four genes to become younger. This is not science fiction. This is not philosophy. This is science. He discovered that you can take an old age and make it young again. This other friend, I will be with him tomorrow in Dublin. I'm going to Dublin to meet with him. We have a big event about longevity in Ireland. Uh, he is the guy who managed to rejuvenate the eyes of blind mice. He took mice that were about 80 human years old and through the Yamanaka factors, the Yamanaka genes, he gave their vision back to the mice. The mice, the eyes of the mice became 20 years old, from 80 to 20. This is a Harvard scientist. Anyway, uh, I invite you all to come to the biggest immortality conference that I helped to organize in Los Angeles, Anaheim, in September. You will meet people, actually, like Ray Kurzweil, and the first human that we are rejuvenating, Liz Parrish. Liz Parrish we call patient zero, because she's the first, time, the first person in human history that has been rejuvenated. So you will learn that this is real and what we will see in the next few years. Death to death. We can cure aging. We can stop aging. Not only we need to get rid of taxes, we need to get rid of death. But also some people, I don't understand, some friends of mine say that they want to age and they want to die. And they say, well, if you want to die, feel free to die. You know, uh, it's like uh, free to choose. If you want to die, die. That's okay. So the world will be left for the immortals, for those who don't want to age. I plan to be younger in the future, not through a through a Russian app, not through FaceApp. I plan to be younger in the future because biotechnology has shown that biological rejuvenation is possible and that this is happening very soon, very soon. In the next 20 years, we will be able to have biological rejuvenation. But we have to meditate. This is important. I love meditation. And as the Chinese say, and the Koreans use the same characters and the Japanese, uh, there is always Yin Yang. And this is so complex that even Yin Yang has inside little Yin Yang. And little Yin Yang has little, little Yin Yang. So there is always the dark side of the force. And we have to be ready for that. And talking about darkness, you know, this is the very famous picture of the world at night. I lived three years in Tokyo, and I went 40 times to Korea, South Korea. And when you look at Korea, you will see the sad reality that there are two Koreas, two Koreas. The Korea of the South, with the best, inter the best internet in Asia, Seoul, Korea, South Korea, has the best internet in the world. Asian, they say the world. But anyway, if you look at North Korea, there is no internet. North Korea is the last country in the world still without public internet. The last country. And South Korea is the country with the best internet, at least of Asia. 
the same Koreans with the same food, the same religion, the same culture, the same history. How can one Korea be so advanced and the other be so backward? That is why liberty, freedom is so important. We don't want to be like North Korea. And really, you don't want to go there because I visited North Korea 10 years ago and I got malaria. North Korea is basically the last country in the Northern Hemisphere where there is still malaria. So be careful if you go to North Korea. Just to finish up with this beautiful, beautiful uh, Chinese um, character that means crisis. In Chinese and Japanese and Korean, they use this. Crisis has two parts. The first part is danger. There is a lot of danger in a crisis like now. But the second character is opportunity. We live in the most incredible times of human history. No other time of human history can be compared to this. Nothing in human history. Of course, there is a lot of danger, but there is the biggest opportunity. I like to say that we are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. So where do you want to be? Do you want to be among the last stupid people who die? Or the first intelligent people who decide to live forever? So welcome to Spain. Come to California with me next month. And remember, because we are going to have dinner soon, in wine, there is wisdom. In beer, there is freedom. And in water, there is bacteria. And muchas, muchas gracias. Thank you. Hello. So uh, you guys can ask questions while I'll be looking for our president. Um, and also, I will send you the two videos. Probably you have seen the philosophy of liberty by Ken Shuland in about 60 languages now, um, uh, just in English, over a million views. I will also send you the other video that we could not see, uh, even though we tried <laughs> and it worked. Um, because that video is really incredible about how humanity will change through super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. And remember, we are going into space. We are truly going to space in the next 10 years, which is so exciting. People don't realize it. In 10 years, we will have the first human base on Mars. When the first human steps on Mars, it will be much more revolutionary than when the first human stepped on the moon. And it will be even more revolutionary than when Jesus Christ walked on water, that no one knows if it was true, if, he, if Jesus Christ walked on water. But a human will walk on Mars in 10 years. That will change everything, everything. When we see how small our tiny planet is. Please. Uh, thank you, Jose, for this powerful and inspiring speech. Uh, Really great stuff. I, I haven't expected anything less than that from you. Uh, could you give us some more uh, details about this rejuvenation of this first person? Uh, is is she been uh, has she been rejuvenated already, or is is she going to be rejuvenated? Which technology and and so on? Yes, um, Liz Parrish. Actually, you can Google her. Um, we have applied for gene therapies on her. Actually, was involved. Um, she got it in Colombia, the first one. Why Colombia? Because there is no over-regulation. In the USA, she's American. She's from uh, uh, Seattle, Washington State. And her technology, actually, believe it or not, was developed in Madrid. Uh, she was injected with a telomerase, which is the enzyme to, that makes the telomeres grow. This was discovered in cancer. Cancer cells are immortal because they continuously grow the end of the chromosomes, which are called telomeres. And they are always long, in good shape, so cancer cells can reproduce, divide, reproduce continuously. So this was discovered in cancer, and it was done here with mice in Spain. So technology from Spain, a patient from uh, Washington State, USA, and the, the therapy was applied in Colombia, because Colombia has no problems with regulations. We went to a private clinic, clinic in Colombia. 
He has tried four different uh, therapies. The first one was injections of telomerase. The second one was another one to uh, fortify muscles. Um, so there are different therapies. They began five years ago, and you can Google her. She has rejuvenated biologically 20 years. She's uh, 51, but if you look at her, she doesn't even look like 30. Uh, so this is being done right now. Uh, the best uh, therapies will continue evolving. I think we will have even better therapies in the next five years. Uh, I plan to use them also in five, ten years when they become cheaper, because when she did it, it cost uh, one million and a half dollars. Right now, her therapy is only about a hundred thousand dollars. In five years, it will be probably ten thousand dollars, and in ten years, it will be a thousand dollars. All these technologies are just being developed. We don't know how they work and in which quantities and in which doses and in which parts of the body. She was injected in 120 places in the body. It was like total acupuncture so that the medicine, the telomerase, would get to all the parts of the body. Uh, now this has been perfected and it doesn't cost so much and um, it is not done all over the body. So this is being developed. There is no book about how to do it. No book about how to become immortal yet, except for my book, The Death of Death. Read The Death of Death. Yeah, great presentation, Jose. A um, couple of questions. One, the idea, I mean, we have between eight and nine billion people on the planet now. If a lot of people quit dying and everybody becomes sort of immortal, uh, what are the implications economically and whatever on the planet? That's question one. And then if we had a group that could die quicker, they would probably be American trial lawyers. And so I'm wondering if you guys have factored in American trial lawyers because all this technology and things look great, but in America, we try to sue everybody for everything and get as much as we can. So what about that? Well, actually talking about lawyers, there is a real concern in the USA that if the lawyers keep on growing so fast, there will soon be more lawyers than population. <laughs> than people in the USA. So yes, we have to stop all these lawyers. Uh, but you know, actually, chat GPT and artificial intelligence will get rid of many lawyers if you don't like lawyers. Chat GPT and artificial intelligence will be able to do many of these things. Going to your more serious question, uh, this concern of overpopulation and lack of resources is very old, very old. Even in um, the apocalypse in the Bible 2,000 years ago, or 220 years ago in Britain, there was this very famous uh, economist, Thomas Malthus. Malthus said it was the end of the world because there were too many people and very few resources. That London had reached one million people and, they, and England had 10 million people and it was the end. There could be no more than one million people in, in, in London. Well, today London, Greater London has 12 million people, which is more than the whole population of England when Malthus was alive. And today, London is cleaner, much wealthier, and better in every sense. So this concern is very old, and it's very wrong. Why is it wrong? Because technology is what changes humanity uh, and makes it advance. When Malthus wrote, we just basically had agriculture with animals. And now we have mechanized agriculture that produces lots of food, and we have other systems of production. So. My problem is the opposite. My worry is that the population is stabilizing and is beginning to decline. The population of Spain will begin declining soon, in 10 years. The population of China is going to collapse. China is going to lose half of its population. So it is not true that there are too many people. The problem is there are too few people. But I'll tell you also something else. People who tell me that argument, that, that uh, there are too many people, I say, if you really believe that there are too many people and you are morally conscious, and ethical with yourself, give the example and commit suicide. You know, if there are too many people, begin with you, get rid of you. But it is not true because I didn't mention it, but the most complex structure in the known universe is the brain of a man. Well, the second most complex structure. The first one is the brain of a woman. But besides the brain of the woman and the man, there is nothing as, as complex that we know in the universe. Maybe tomorrow there will be a Martian and uh, they have a bigger brain than us. 
but until that time, nothing more complex. And so what has changed in the last 200 years? That we have more people, we have more brains. It is true that we have a mouth to eat and to destroy, and we have an ass to excrete, but we have a brain, the most advanced structure in the universe. So it doesn't matter how much we eat or excrete, we have the brain to create, to innovate, to think, to dream, to love the brain. So that is why we'd, we would need to have more people, but it is not happening. The population of the planet will stabilize in the 2050s and begin declining in the planet. That is also why we need to kill death, because we don't need to let people die, unless you are communist. I actually have a follow-up also, since Jacek is on important business. <laughs> so, uh, to the, a follow-up to this question. So, uh, innovation is innovation when it becomes cheap and accessible. So then I imagine uh, immortality would not be, uh, w w would be by necessity a scarce resource. Therefore, uh, some people will afford it and some not. And then you will have probably continents with, you know, immo immortal people in this way. But Nigeria, uh, like as you, you could see on this uh, chart, Nigeria skyrocketing. And wouldn't it create, for example, like two castes of people, the immortals and the mortals, and wouldn't they clash between each other? And it would be like an ontological difference, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and okay, um, this is like the second most typical question. The most typical question is about a lack of resources over population. The second most typical question is uh, it will create uh, disparities, inequalities, it will be too expensive. That is chapter five of my book, The Death of Death. But I will tell you, this will be free. Listen to this. This will cost nothing to the consumer, nothing. Let me give you an example. How much did you pay for the COVID vaccine? The individual. You paid nothing. And COVID was a, a little pandemic. It was nothing. COVID was nothing. I'd paralyzed the world for two years. A little pandemic that didn't kill many people. Well, it killed 10 million people. That's horrible. But it's nothing in historical terms. And you paid zero. Zero. Why? Because it was paid by governments, corporations, United Nations, Bill Gates, etc. So, if this tiny pandemic paralyzed the world uh, and made the vaccines free for people, the same will be with the anti-aging therapies. They will be free. If they are not free, there will be a revolution the following day. If some people became immortal and other people didn't become immortal, there could be a, a revolution immediately. But I will tell you why this will be free also. First, because right now, 80% of the medical cost, as I said, is at the end of the life of the person, and people still die, 80% of the money. If you put this at the beginning so that you don't age, you will save all of that. But the main reason why this will be free is because we are very cheap. Chemically, we are not worth a hundred euros. I think all of you know that we are 70% water, right? 70% water. And we are not Perrier water, Evian water. We are tap water. So 70% of you is dirty water. And bacteria, yes, with bacteria. <laughs> the other 30% of us is the most abundant elements and cheaper elements on the planet. We have carbon. We have nitrogen, we, we have potassium, uh, we have sodium. We are basically eight elements, eight chemical elements. And if you put these eight chemical elements, it doesn't cost 100 euros. So we are very cheap, very, very cheap. And to keep a machine that is cheap will be cheap once we get to nanotechnology. And we are getting to the nanotechnology level in 10 to 20 years. So it will be free. It is chapter five of my book. I explain why this will be free. I know it sounds impossible, incredible, but it is not. Because we are cheap, you are not 100 euros. In fact, ask your mother and father, how much money did you, did you spend when I was conceived? Probably they, they didn't spend 100 euros. Well, maybe they had some caviar and champagne and it was 150. <laughs> but but uh, we are cheap to make, we are cheap to maintain, and now with nanotechnology, we will be cheap to stay alive forever. And this will be free 
or otherwise there will be a revolution, not a communist revolution. There will be a revolution of everybody, everybody. So anyway, this is the time, the best time to be alive, to continue alive. So please do not die. Certainly do not die until we next meet in a special location, right? In the next Liberty International World Conference. So as always, my friends, live long and prosper. Thank you.